Jesus, uh, you once said, everyone who hears your words and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. But everyone who hears your words and does not do them will be like a foolish man who's built their house on the sand. When the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house, it fell and great was the fall of it. Jesus, we want to build our life on your word. We know that no scripture comes from human interpretation, but it's like a rock. Men spoke from you as they were carried along by your Holy Spirit. Your word, the scriptures, are a rock we want to stand on. And as we explore this passage this morning in the book of Acts, Jesus, help us to hear it. Help us to hear your word clearly. Enlighten our hearts, open up our minds, open up our eyes in wonder. Enable us, by your grace, to submit to it, to stand strong with boldness, to know that on this rock we are on solid ground. In your name we pray, King Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. a couple uh, months ago, it was actually, it was out of a year ago, I shared the story of Ross Vogt with you all. Ross uh, wrote an opinion piece for his alma mater. His alma mater is a well-known Christian college. And in this opinion piece, it wasn't long, it was about 500 words or so, he made the simple claim that Jesus through his cross and through his resurrection is the only way to eternal life. It's a very simple piece. And in, the piece was published and it made a great impression. It made a great impression, especially on those who had graduated from his alma mater and their concern was that their alma mater was softening on their view of Jesus, that Jesus is the only way of salvation. But even though it made a great impression on that camp, it didn't make it a great impression on everyone. For others, it actually aroused opposition. Because Vote in 2020, he was appointed as the director of the Office of Management and Budget. This is a presidentially appointed position, and it has to be approved and confirmed by the Senate. And as votes sat for his Senate confirmation hearing, his opinion piece was unearthed. And at his confirmation, vote was questioned relentlessly. Did you really write that? Do you really believe this? How can you really hold to that? Do you still think this? What do you say to someone who doesn't believe in that or this? And the piece aroused such opposition that one senator, in his closing remarks, finishing off the hearing, spoke a vote saying, quote, In my view, the statement made by the man before us is indefensible, it is hateful, it is religiously intolerant, and it is an insult to billions of people with different faiths throughout the world. And as he closed, the senator saying to his colleagues, said this country since its inception has struggled sometimes with great pain to overcome discrimination in all forms. We must not go backward. This man before us is unfit for this position. I recommend we do not confirm his appointment. 45 others agreed, voting against vote, who was ultimately placed in the position nonetheless. In one sense, that's, that's really surprising. It's surprising because Christianity in the United States and statements like the one vote made, they've always been more or less mainstream since the inception of the United States. Christianity has been regarded favorably. And so it's a surprise as Americans that somebody would get such brushback, such opposition, especially for a piece that he wrote in a Christian journal. But in another sense, as Christians, it's not surprising in the least. In fact, Jesus, the first time he sent out his apostles, this is the book of Acts that we're studying now, and this is the message of how God poured out his Holy Spirit on his apostles, on his church, and they go out and they are witnesses throughout the world to the work of Jesus. But Jesus had prepared his apostles beforehand, sending them out a first time. And when he did send them out the first time, he gave them this warning. He said, don't be surprised if this happens. He said, behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. 
So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. He went on and said, Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against their parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Following Jesus will arouse opposition. Jesus himself says, you're you're like sheep. In the midst of a world of wolves, you will experience opposition. You'll face resistance. You will be persecuted. You will even be hated for the sake of the name of Jesus. So it's not surprising in the least that as the name of Jesus in in the book of Acts begins to make an impression on more and more people, it also arouses opposition as well. In Acts chapter 3, this is immediately following Pentecost. Pentecost is the day when Jesus ascended into heaven and then poured out his Holy Spirit on his apostles. And in Acts chapter 3, The apostles are doing these miraculous works, works that had not been seen since Jesus was around. And there's this story of their walking up to the temple to be witnesses to Jesus, to tell people the truth about Jesus. And as they're walking up, they see a man who's been a a lame man, paralyzed since birth, standing near a gate in the temple called the Beautiful Gate. And he's crying out for alms. He doesn't have money. He's saying, I need silver. I need gold. He can't work. So Peter and John, they go up to the man and they say, hey, we don't have any silver. We don't have any gold. But what we do have is this. And looking him in the face, they said, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And the man, for the first time in his life, his ankles are strengthened. He stands up for the first time and he rejoices and walks with Peter and John into the temple where Peter and John are received as rock stars. And you see, everybody wants to know, how did these men do this? So in verse 11, these people flock to Peter and John. The whole city rushes to the temple, and Peter, just like he did at Pentecost, uses the miracle, he uses the sign to talk about the one to whom the sign points, to talk about the one who performed the miracle, to talk about the name of Jesus. And so Peter stands up, And he says in all the people's hearing, he says, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety, we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you delivered over to be denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. You denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. It's the name of Jesus, the author of life, the holy and righteous one. It's in the name of Jesus who is crucified and raised from the dead. It's in the name of Jesus by faith in his name that this man, lame from birth, now is perfect in the presence of you all. So there's only one thing to do. Just as this physical healing as if from death to life, represents a spiritual transformation. Peter says in the hearing of everyone, here's your response, verse 19, repent and turn back that your sins may be blotted out and times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. The miracle is It's a tangible sign, a visible demonstration that if you have faith in Jesus, if you repent and turn to Jesus, your sins can be blotted out. You too will be resurrected. You too will receive eternal life at the hand of God. Just as Jesus restores the lame man to perfect health physically, 
we spiritually can be renewed. We can be forgiven of our sins, receive resurrection life, and be assured of fellowship with God eternally. And this message about the name of Jesus, just like it did at Pentecost, it it makes a great impression on ordinary people. Look at verse 4, chapter 4. It says, many of those who heard the word, the word of Peter, believed And the number of men came to about 5,000 as people are flocking to the name of Jesus. It made a great impression on ordinary people, but as we should expect, it arouses opposition as well. And that brings you into chapter 4, verse 1. It says, as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. The captain of the temple, this was a man who was a priest and he was second in rank to the high priest. And he had charge over all the temple dealings. He had to make sure that sacrifices were offered correctly. He wanted to maintain peace on the temple grounds. And then there's another group. They're described as the Sadducees. They do not believe in the resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. These men, <laughs> these men were sophisticated, they were educated, they were wealthy priests in Jerusalem, and they denied the idea of the resurrection. They actually denied pretty much anything that was supernatural in character. And it says, as they heard Peter and John at his right hand teaching about Jesus, verse 2, it says that they were greatly annoyed. <sighs> this stuff again... <laughs> Here we go again. They're greatly annoyed. And you see why they're greatly annoyed. It says it explicitly. It says, because Peter was teaching the people, proclaiming in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. Do you want to speak about God generally? Fine. You want to speak about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob? Okay, we're all Jews here. That's good. You want to have a dialogue about speculation of eternal life, great. You want to have a conversation about the notion of resurrection and the theoretical possibility of resurrection, sure. You want to teach about the concept of forgiveness, no problem. We'll even allow you to gather a group of people and discuss those possibilities. That's totally fine. But if you want to talk specifics, if you want to Start talk, talking about the literal resurrection of Jesus that was witnessed by others and verified historically. If you want to teach about a Jesus who truly ascended into heaven and entered into eternal life. If you want to insist that Jesus was actually crucified for actual sins consider, uh, committed by actual people forgiving them of their actual sins in his name. Now you've gone a step too far. You can talk about God generally. You're free to discuss ideas and theories, no problem at all. But if you want to teach about God specifically, if you want to talk about Jesus specifically, no, 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 you've gone too far. You are the weakest link. Goodbye, we're coming to get you. You want to be today a spiritual person? Or if you want to be a person who believes in a greater power, you want to talk about living a moral and virtuous grounded life, if you want to talk about spiritual journeys and meditation, that is completely fine. You can do that. You'll even be invited onto a midday talk show to share your views. But herein lies the problem. Jesus is not a concept. He is not an idea. He is not a vague spiritual reality that you have to close your mind and listen to your heart to tap into. No, Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. He is the Word of God at the beginning, one with God the Father, the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of the divine nature, the king and creator of every person in this room, the king and creator of the universe, who for our sake and for our salvation took on human flesh to actually be crucified for sins, to actually bear the wrath and punishment of God for human sin, to actually rise again from the dead and actually forgive sins and command faith in his name for eternal life. God in general as a concept, it's never going to arouse opposition. It never has and it never will. But following, proclaiming, standing with 
Jesus? Ugh. That will. And that's precisely what happens. Look at verse 3. The priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees arrested them. That's Peter. That's John. Oh, and the healed paralytic, because somehow he's a troublemaker in all this too. They say, hey, you, you go and sit in the cell with him. And they put them in custody where they would stand trial before the Jewish council the next day. Peter and John, you have to realize, these were two of the first disciples called by Jesus. He actually called them to follow him specifically. And they traveled with Jesus for years. So I have to think that as these men are sitting in this jail cell, a cell meant to deter crime, it's a cell meant to make you question, do you really want to do this? You really want to continue on this route that you're going on. You really want to proclaim Jesus, stand with Jesus, follow Jesus. Is he really worth all this trouble? I have to think that as they're sitting in that cell with this paralytic who they've just healed, they had to be thinking back to the first time that Jesus had sent them out. They had to be thinking, hey, do you remember? Jesus said this would happen. Jesus said that this was going to happen. It's no surprise. He said to us, they will deliver you over to courts. You will be dragged before governors to bear witness before them. And he said this would happen. He said, this is going to be the case. You are sheep among wolves. But he made us this promise. He also said that when they arrest you, when they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you're to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of the Father speaking through you. And as the sun rises on the next day, hopefully they slept. They probably didn't. But the court gathers, the Jewish Sanhedrin. These were 71 of the most influential, most powerful leading men in Israel, composed of elders, composed of the high priests, and all other powerful individuals in Jerusalem. And in verse 5 and 6, you see who is... Uh, made up this council, elders, scribes, Ananias, or sorry, Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, his son, John and Alexander, who are all of the high priestly fa family. These were the same men who just months before, just weeks before, in fact, had arrested, questioned, tried, and convicted Jesus. And now they ask the question of the apostles. The questioning begins, verse 7, they ask, by what power or by what name do you do this? How did you do that? How did you heal this man? In what name did you perform this miracle? In what name are you doing these things? Then Peter, verse 8, says it was, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, as promised by Jesus. He's filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man... By what may, means this man has been healed? Then let it be known to all of you and to all people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This miracle is nothing new. It's nothing new. Uh, on his way to Jerusalem to be arrested by you, Sanhedrin, Jesus healed a woman who had been disabled for 18 years. On his way to Jerusalem to be questioned and tried by you, he cleansed 10 lepers, 10 men who were ceremonially unclean, making them clean, removing their leprosy permanently just outside of the Jerusalem gates. One week before he would be convicted by you, Sanhedrin, he healed a man who was blind, unable to see, giving him sight for the very first time in his life. This is nothing new. This Jesus, you crucified him. You, the religious leaders of Israel, entrusted with the spiritual welfare of the people of God, put the Savior from God to death. But he didn't stay dead. He didn't stay dead. He was crucified, dead, and buried for three days. But on the third day, he performed the greatest miracle of them all, the final miracle. It was nothing new. He was resurrected from the dead. It's by the power and the name of that Jesus, not us. We're just men. We're just followers of Jesus. 
By the way, that's very different from people who say that they can heal today. The attraction is on them, their ministry, their insights, their wisdom, their healing power. Not here. No, this isn't the power in the name of Jesus. It's in that name that this man is standing today before you in perfect health in the presence of all. And don't miss this. Notice the specificity with which they speak. Verse 11. They say, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has now become the cornerstone. It doesn't get much more specific than that, but they add to it, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You notice the specificity? There is only one power. There is only one Savior. There is only one Christ, and there is only one name. No one else under heaven. No one we can go to by whom we must be saved. My kids and I, before we go to bed at night, we usually read, you know, one Bible story or a story from like another Christian book, and we've been reading Pilgrim's Progress. It's a children's version of Pilgrim's Progress, three volumes. And if you're not familiar with Pilgrim's Progress, it's kind of an allegory of the Christian life. It's an allegory of what it looks like to journey through earth toward the kingdom of God. And there's one rule throughout Pilgrim's Progress. It's a very simple rule. It's this, do not step off of the king's path. You must stay on the king's path. There will be other paths that look more wise. There's going to be other paths that look more appealing. There are going to be other paths that look easier. Others will insist that they're on the right path and you need to get on their path, but you can't join them. The only way is one specific narrow way to enter the kingdom. You must stay on the path marked Jesus. And three of the main characters, one is named Jude, the other is Mercy, the other is Eli, on their way toward the kingdom of heaven, they come across a man who's a little bit off the path, and his name is Ignorance. And Ignorance is a little bit strange because he's not making any progress. In fact, he's just kind of walking in a circle, humming a tune to himself. And it's strange, and... They're not sure what to do with it. So Mercy calls out to the man and says, what are you doing? Can't you see the king's path? It's it's right here. He's shown you the way. Come on over. It even says king's path on it. And the man, ignorance, looks back and responds, ah, yes, that path is fine for some. As far as me and I'm concerned, I'm just following my heart and my heart has never led me astray. I'm going to continue to follow my heart. And Jude, one of the main characters, is baffled by this. He, he says, but haven't you heard what the king says? He tells us to walk on the narrow path. It's right here in his book. We're on it. Ignorance is frustrated at this point. He, he says, well, then you walk there if that's your choice. The king's word's an old book anyway, and there are many ways to interpret it. Who really knows in the first place? Ignorance then is kind of fed up, so he gets into a boat to leave the children, and on the side of the boat is engraven the name of the boat, which is falsehood. And he gets into the boat, and he starts singing the tune that he was humming, and he sings, you take your path, and I'll take mine, and in the end, we'll all be fine. And Jude makes one final plea as he starts to drift away in his boat, and he shouts, but there's only one true path. The king's son is the way, the truth, and the life. You can't enter his kingdom except through faith in him. And ignorance shouts back in the distance, I've met pilgrims like you before. You're a closed-minded bunch, but I know in my heart there are many paths to the king's city. And he continues to sing, they're on their path and I'm on mine, and in the end we'll all be fine. And he continues to hum and sing that tune into the very next page where he approaches a waterfall and completely plunges down into his destruction. never to be heard of again. All other roads not marked explicitly and specifically with the name of Jesus Christ, no other road will save, no other road will deliver, no other road will lead to eternal life. All other roads lead to destruction. 
That's why Peter says what he does in, in verse 11, quoting Isaiah the prophet. He says, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone. Isaiah used that phrase. He spoke that way to his contemporaries to tell them the foundation that you're standing on right now, if it's not upheld by this cornerstone, it will be destroyed. If you reject the cornerstone or you oppose the cornerstone Jesus, if you refuse to build on him, then Jesus will reject you and he will oppose you. All other foundations, paths, philosophies, religions, if they're not explicitly and specifically marked Jesus, then they are paths marked for destruction. It doesn't matter what the sign says, what it's marked. It could be a path that is marked, follow your heart. It could be a path that is marked, be true to yourself. It could be marked, I'm not as bad as that person path. It could be marked, look within path, or the universe path, or the try harder path, or the authenticity path, the self-help, the self-help path, the other religions path. At the end of the day, on the back of all those paths marked the way that they are, if you flip it over, all of them are marked with two words, ignorance and falsehood. And following them will lead you further and further and further adrift from Jesus, who is the true, certain, specific, verifiable, actual, and only true path. The Sanhedrin respond to this. You see it in verse 13. It says, When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. Hmm. Hmm. Wow, there's something different about these guys. These are uneducated common men. The Greek word for common is idiotes. It's not commending them necessarily. They see this bold witness, their specificity with which they speak, and they come to realize, they have this flashback. Wait, we've heard another common man speak like this before. Talk to us in this way. And they realize, oh, these are the same guys that had been with Jesus. The boldness, the power, the miracles, the teaching, these are his disciples, his apostles. And you may not know this, but Jesus, he actually quoted this same passage from Isaiah to these very men. He quoted it to them specifically and directly to tell them that they were on the wrong path, to teach them the very same point. Luke actually recounts this. These men, one day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple, this was during the last week of Jesus' life, and he was preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders, the Sanhedrin, they came up and said to him, tell us by what authority you do these things or who it is that gave you this authority. Does that sound familiar? He answered them, I also will ask you a question, now tell me. And Jesus began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant. But they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I'll send my beloved son. Perhaps they'll respect him. God had sent prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet to the people of Israel, to their leadership, to tell them, repent, turn back, turn back to God for the salvation of your souls. The power with which you yield your religious authority at this moment, it is about to be overturned. Jesus continued and said, but when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? That's what Jesus' question is. And then he answers. He says, he will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. 
And when they heard this, they said, surely not. No, we're, we're the people of God. We are the religious leaders of Israel, Jesus. God won't oppose us. But Jesus looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And Jesus makes this very point. If you reject or oppose that stone, the stone will reject and oppose you. He goes on to say, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken in pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And the scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. Sanhedrin heard this before, this boldness, this witness, these miracles, this teaching, this message, the specificity, and their response was to crucify the one who originally delivered the message, to reject the cornerstone, to oppose Christ. And here are Peter and John reminding them of this very point. If you oppose Jesus, he is going to oppose you. And you will be overthrown to your own destruction. Verse 15, but when they had commanded them to leave the council, the Sanhedrin now are conspiring Together, when they commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do to these men? A notable sign has been performed through them. It's evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in the name of Jesus. I don't know if you've noticed this, but things that Christians believe and have always believed, once considered good, once considered healthy, once considered loving, once considered righteous and good for people to be spread. Now they're considered dangerous. They shouldn't be spread, shouldn't be taught. It's it's no different than the time of Peter and John. I've shared this story before, but it bears repeating. I had a friend who I went to grad school with and we kind of took different paths. I became a pastor. He became a psychologist and a counselor. And I called him one time and asked him, hey, we're we're asking these questions as a church. What do we do around what the culture is saying around gender, about gender dysphoria and, and all of these things about sexuality? And as a good counselor, he said, well, what do you think? And so I said, well, God created humankind male and female. And that because of sin that's entered the world, that original good creation of God has been corrupted. It's been distorted. So, of course, our minds, our will, our desires, our feelings, even our sense of self is going to be tainted in some way by sin. So when it comes to gender confusion and dysphoria, our belief is that the most healthy approach, the most flourishing approach a person can take will come when we live into who God has created us to be as male and female, not seeking to change our identity or our gender based on our distress. So I said, well, what would your colleagues think of that? How, how are you guys thinking through this? If, if they heard that idea, what would be their response? And he said, well, they would think you're an ignorant bigot. Deer Creek, Jesus says as clearly as he can, following, proclaiming, and standing with him, following the king's book, going on his path, it'll arouse opposition. Sometimes it will even lead to persecution. But the response to that opposition is always the same. Verse 19, in love, with gentleness, with respect, the response with Peter and John is to say, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. But we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Dear Creek, listen to the words of Jesus. Jesus wanted to remind his apostles, his followers, when you stand with me, This is what to expect. He said, if the world hates you, know that it's hated me before it hated you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll also persecute you. If they kept my word, then they will be 
kept, they will also keep yours. I have said these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think that he's offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. If Jesus, who is the most loving, the most compassionate, the most kind, the most gentle, the most gracious man who ever walked on earth, if he aroused opposition and persecution, we should not be surprised that we, his servants, are treated in the same way as Jesus, the master. Some of you have had the conversations. You've talked with loved ones. You were respectful. You're gentle. You're honest. You're loving. You're kind. You're patient. You labor with people. And in love, you say along with Peter and John, we, we have to speak what we've heard. There's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name. Jesus, under heaven by which we must be saved. Some of you are having conversations like that now with loved ones, with coworkers, with friends, with grandchildren, with your own children. And Jesus wants you to know, he said these things that you might remember them. He said them to keep you from falling away. A servant is not greater than his master. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before you. The name of Jesus will make a great impression. It absolutely will because it's a powerful name. Because he's a powerful savior, especially when we speak of him in clarity and specificity. Because Jesus is not a concept. He's not an unknown power. He can be known. He's a personal God. But don't be surprised if it arouses opposition as well, even persecution. Peter and John, at this point, they're warned and they're released. They're warned one more time. Don't speak in the name of Jesus. And in response, they share what happened to them and they pray along with the rest of the church in verse 24. They lift up their voices and say, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. It's remarkable. The church's response to persecution is remarkable. If this were written today, again, I have to think, if this were written in conservative evangelical circles, it might read this. Peter and John went to the church and reported all that the priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they organized a letter and lawsuit to be sent to the governor to complain about their religious liberty that was being infringed upon. They hired a civil liberties law firm to represent them, and they recorded the incident and posted it on YouTube so that every other Christian would feel self-righteous indignation. How dare they? Don't they know that this is a Christian nation? And they were even interviewed on a nightly news program. And they prayed that their First Amendment case would ultimately reach the Supreme Court and hopefully be overturned so that they could stand with Jesus in a culture of religious comfort where everyone else affirmed their values and beliefs. In other words, God, make the culture easier. Ease the opposition. Make the culture less hostile. Alternatively, if this were written to many liberal or progressive Protestant circles, it might read this. Peter and John went to the church and reported what the priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they considered how they could really listen to the objections and be as nuanced and winsome and as appealing as they could be in the future around the message of Jesus. 
They spoke less about the doctrine of Jesus' specificity and downplayed the idea of eternal destruction. And then they posted videos on YouTube so that everyone knew they were not like those narrow-minded Christians as they were more welcoming in an inclusive community. And they prayed that their church would be a cornucopia of diversity and comfort where they would affirm every value and belief that the world already holds. In other words, God, make our message more like the world. Let the opposition know we're just like them. Make the message less hostile, Jesus. But that's not the prayer. Verse 29, the prayer is simple. Sovereign Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They don't compromise the message, nor do they insist on change in the culture. No, they pray for boldness to proclaim the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus who is true, certain, specific, verifiable, actual, and the only true way to God. Don't be surprised, Deer Creek. The name of Jesus will make an impression on more and more and more people into that. We rejoice, but don't be surprised if it arouses opposition as well. What we need most of all is to speak the name of Jesus with gentleness, with respect, with love. But what we need most of all is to speak the name of Jesus with all boldness. Again, back to Pilgrim's Progress as I close. There's a scene when Christian and Faithful, the two main characters of the story, go into Vanity Fair. Vanity Fair is a town that opposes the name of Jesus. It's a, name, it's, a, it's a town that mocks the name of Jesus, derides the name of Jesus. And as they go into Vanity Fair, they simply proclaim that they're walking on the king's path and they want others to join. And as they proclaim that message and it makes an impression on some, others oppose it and they throw faithful and Christian in jail, condemned to be executed. And as faithful one morning is being taken off to be executed, Christian shouts out to faithful, be strong, faithful. Don't be afraid. They can destroy our bodies, but they cannot destroy our souls. I'll see you in the kingdom. God, give Deer Creek boldness. Give us faithfulness, sincerity of heart to share the name of the only one who has power to save, the name of King Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the King of kings, you're the Lord of lords. We thank you for reminding us of this truth, a truth that can often be uncomfortable and often hard to believe that there is salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given by which we must be saved. Give us hearts that believe that, Jesus. Give us hearts that long to share that. Give us boldness to share that message and Father, we praise you that you so love the world that you gave us your only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal, everlasting life. We thank you that you love sinners like us. We thank you that when we were hopeless and lost, you provided a way to be reconciled to you. We thank you for the name of Jesus, the only way, the cornerstone, the king, the true redeemer of us, your children. We pray all of this in the name of of him, your son, in the beautiful name of King Jesus and all God's people said,